The fat bastard hotel manager, Brian Pinchfist, was no longer fat. Whether he was still a bastard remained to be seen. He claimed to police he'd been kidnapped and held underground by people unknown to him who disguised their appearance and voices. He had been found by a Portsmouth ranger, Jet, John Edward Thomas Norris, having been unceremoniously dumped beside the incongruously garish, pastel-coloured bathing huts on Eastney Beach, the pink one. Frozen, soaking wet and filthy, his almost skeletal body lost in his baggy, shabby rags, he had shivered uncontrollably on a foul early November morning. He had only a motley crew of noxious-smelling tramps for company, if you excluded, or could see, the equally skeletal ghost, hauntingly concerned for Pinchfist's welfare. Standing off from the toxic collection of human detritus was Jet, who, although more aromatically agreeable, had an equally comparable toxic personality. The street people were too polite to mention that Pinchfist, this skinny, raggedy bastard, smelt pretty much as they did, except for maybe the meths and special brew. Jet was not so circumspect in his verbal exchanges to fat bastard or the tramps. He was often on the receiving end of critical denigration, not least his colleagues calling him Knobhead when he wanted people to call him Jet, a cool name. So he enjoyed any opportunity to pass on some vitriol in equal measure in the manner of all good bullies. Apparently, during his near three months of captivity, the fat bastard was made to negotiate every scrap of food, frequently unsuccessfully, and had to learn to go without, or so he claimed. The doctors said he was in reasonable shape, considering, as though he had been on a well-controlled emergency diet. Quite remarkable. There appeared to be no ill effects if you ignored the pong, they said, ignoring the pong, and Pinchfist himself, who cowered, cartoon-like, behind a drip stand. Pinchfist was unaware he had been missing for so long, and looked forward to being reunited with his family, and was amazed when, after hospital discharge, he was immediately arrested, and within a short time, incarcerated again although this room did have a window, even if it had evident bars, and the police were moderately polite. His confusion was exacerbated when it was explained to him the cell's tease maid was on the blink, though they did give him a sausage sandwich, but that sense of temporary rapture was spoiled when the chief inspector, a man called Jane Austen, said he would like to shove the sausages up his ass. Meteorologically, he said, but probably meant metaphorically. Prior to his disappearance, the obese manager had huffed and puffed his way through his hotel remedial and refurbishment works, had manipulated all of the payments to suppliers, and reneged on the final account, so the builder lost a considerable sum of money. He had excuses, of course, and all the builder could do was watch as everyone believed the fat bastard. The builder and his family suffered. They cut back. People gave him time to pay the incurred debts. He was a good man. But enough was enough, and other people had their own bills to pay, didn't they? A deal was offered, but it would go nowhere near what was owed, although it was acknowledged a good job had been done. Small comfort. What goes around comes around. More small comfort, and offered by comfortably well-off people who knew only square meals. Even if it came around and visited itself upon Brian Pinchfist, what would it achieve? Everybody believed the fat bastard. He was making a profit for the hotel for the first time, and the owners turned their own blind eye. So Pinchfist was arrogantly immune and snuffled his piggish way around the hotel, bullying, stuffing and gorging, uncaring of the pain he caused other people. 